220. No God, no law. Calcedon Position Paper, number 44, November 1983. The German, Karl Schurz, came to the United States after the failure of the Revolution of 1848. They find the nature of the American states to be dramatically different from Europe. Here in America, you can see how slightly a people needs to be governed. In fact, the thing that is not named in Europe without a shudder, anarchy exists here in full bloom. David Tayak and Elizabeth Hansot, Managers of Virtue, page 19. What Schertz meant was that civil government was at a minimum, especially on the state and federal levels. There was almost no government other than the self-government of the Christian man. Now, in 1983, the powers of the state are vastly increased. Only in the most nominal sense does the United States have the same kind of civil government it had then. From an almost non-existent civil government, the United States has moved to a highly centralised, omnipresent power state. From a free republic and a loose federation of states, it has become an increasingly fascist order. Fascism is that form of socialism which maintains the facade of private ownership and the free market while controlling all things with regulations so as to socialise all things. At the same time, quote, laws, end quote, have also increased at a phenomenal rate. Man-made laws replacing the rule of God's law. The increase of laws has not led to any increased order. The increase of lawlessness and crime has been phenomenal. At the same time, the modern state has become humanistic and hence determined to play God. This has meant that its goal has become more and more power and total control. Because the state sees itself as absolute, it recognises no superior law and no superior being as having any binding power over it. Lin Piao, the Chinese revolutionary leader, expressed the faith of the modern state very bluntly. Political power is an instrument by which one class oppresses another. It is exactly the same with revolution and with counter-revolution. As I see it, political power is the power to oppress others. Paul Johnson, Modern Times, page 556. When we read the writings of Marxist and fascist leaders, it becomes apparent that George Orwell's vision in 1984 was not inaccurate when he described the goal of the humanistic state as power and the purpose of that power as a boot stamping on a human face forever. In such a society, there can be no law. Law assumes a higher order, a justice above and over man and the state which both must serve. Walter Kaufman in Without Guilt and Justice, 1973, was logical. By denying the God of Scripture, he denied also guilt or innocence, and justice or injustice as invalid. They were simply implications and aspects of faith in God and his higher order. Humanistic man must be beyond good and evil. This means also that humanistic man is beyond law. There can be no higher law governing or binding man. As Paul Johnson noted, there is no Marxist philosophy of law. Yevgeny Pashukhinis, a Soviet legal theoretician, pursued the issue logically and declared that, in a true socialist society, law would be replaced by plan. Paul Johnson, Modern Times, Page 679. During the 1930s, the plan led to, among other things, the death of Pashukhinis. He was, however, right. Soviet society is governed not by law, but by plans. The same is increasingly true in the rest of the world. Most, quote, laws, end quote, today are bureaucratic regulations created by some federal, state, 
county or city agency or planning commission. The number of laws enacted by representative legislative bodies is small by comparison. Power is moving from the legislative bodies to the planning agencies which they created. This leads to a curious fact. The number of lawyers is proliferating, but the traditional practice of law is giving way to bureaucratic law. Law is ceasing to be law in any historic sense. Recently, the American Bar Association expressed dismay at the bad image lawyers have with the public. That bad image is not unique to lawyers. Politicians are commonly despised. Bankers are distrusted. So too are doctors. The clergy are in disrepute, and so on. Virtually every calling is held in contempt or viewed, at least, with suspicion. Since all have become infected with relativism, all are viewed with distrust. In law, irrelevant technicalities of form overrule the substantive claims of justice, a condition not limited to law, although especially deadly where justice is the issue. The plan is replacing law, and the plan is a humanistic concept. It represents man's ad hoc concept of order, and the plan allows no disagreement, because no higher law exists, it is believed, to judge the plan. As one of Stalin's economists, S. G. Schumilin, said, Our task is not to study economics, but to change it. We are bound by no laws. Johnson, page 267. The word law in its origin and its still current meaning is that which is laid, set, or fixed. It is referenced to an established standard. But it is no longer true of law that it gives us a fixed standard. It is, at its best, a rubber yardstick. Early in the 1970s, a lawyer remarked with disgust that too often he did not know what the law was until he went to court and heard the judge give the law a new meaning. Men no longer seek to conform themselves and their societies to God's higher law, rather they conform the law to society's demands. Such an attitude is not new. It has been the goal of tyranny for many centuries. Let us remember that the root meaning of tyranny is ruled by man's law. WPM Kennedy noted of Queen Elizabeth I, The Elizabethan ideal in religion was national unity. Studies in Tudor History, page 233. Tudor despotism brought even family devotions in private under the spying supervision of Tudor agents. Homes were regularly searched for the slightest evidences of Catholic piety. Later, the same interest was shown in discovering Puritan piety. Both Catholics and Puritans refused to recognise the monarch's headship over the church. In Kennedy's words, It was a dangerous experiment to scorn her governorship of the church. She was, in a very real sense, what Lord North described her. Our God on earth... And the Puritan appeal to scripture was, in her eyes, political heresy, as it dishonoured the national church of which she was supreme governor. The insult was an insult to the throne, and the throne was a Tudor throne. Pages 242 and 243. One can add that law was also, to a large degree, Tudor law. The problem was not new. It was an attitude common to pagan antiquity. Darius of Persia at least qualified his power, declaring, By the grace of Ahura Mazda, I am king. But the Roman emperors made no such qualification as imperial theology developed. Rome's central cult was the worship of Rome itself. Michael Grant, the climax of Rome, Page 164 
The persistent tendency of political theology over the centuries has been to make the state absolute, God walking on earth, and the source of law. This objective has never had more eager and more philosophical justification than in the modern era. Especially since the French Revolution, it has become basic to the modern age. It is worthy of note that two basic concepts of this era are totally lacking in the US Constitution. Neither the words sovereignty nor nation appear in that document. Sovereignty was held to be an attribute of God alone, and the nation-state was not seen as the standard. Rather, the prevailing concept of the American framers was of a freedom and justice state. Today, the US Constitution has a radically different meaning, and it has been reinterpreted and rewritten, in effect, to include federal sovereignty and nationhood. At the same time, life has been politicized. To live under the rule of law is one thing, but to live under the rule of politics and planning, emphatically something else. John Lukash has summed it up very clearly. The administrator, rather than the producer, has become the typical and respected American occupation. John Lucas, A New History of the Cold War, page 295. The triumph of the administrator is a triumph in every sphere, in politics, industry, the church, education, and elsewhere. It is the triumph of planning over law, because the administrator's goal is not a given order, but the control of all factors in terms of his plan. So far has this emphasis on man-made planning gone that Nobel laureate Sir Francis Crick has said that man's planning should establish what is human. No newborn infant should be declared human until it has passed certain tests regarding its genetic endowment, and if it fails these tests... It forfeits the right to live. T. Howard and J. Rifkin, Who Should Play God, page 81. Crick is not alone in this opinion. It is shared by others. One aspect of it is abortion. The champions of abortion refuse to recognise any law of God over them. For them, the essential question is whether or not the unborn baby fits into their plan. We have state planning because we have personal planning, which is in defiance of God's law. Where men can choose their forms of sexual expression in defiance of God's law, take the lives of unborn babies at will, and assume the prerogative of directing their lives without God, there will be no hesitation to apply the same principles of humanistic planning in the realm of the state. Law gives way to planning. The tragic fact in this process is that lawyers, who should be champions of the law, have become extensively advocates of planning. Charles Maurice traced this change back to the era before the French Revolution. The old regime badly needed accountants. While what she had was lawyers. Not lawyers with any real sense of law, but lawyers whose heads were full of plans. They talked, therefore, of the rights of man and proceeded to execute men to achieve their planned society. Charles Moraz, The Triumph of the Middle Class, pages 113 following. The plans could be described as good intentions. But the good intentions of fallen, sinful men have a crippling and evil effect on social order. The great superstition of the modern age is a political superstition. It is the belief that more power in the hands of the state can lead to a better plan and to man's triumph under the plan. In terms of this superstition, man will eliminate poverty, prejudice, war and a host of other evils by means of the plan. Hence, more power to the state The plan supplants law. 
God's law. The plan denies justice or righteousness. It recognizes only the supremacy of the power state and the philosopher kings, or, quote, scientific, end quote, planners thereof. Because justice, God's justice, stands always above and over man and man's plan, the plan works to exclude God's law or justice, and it therefore wages war against biblical faith. If there is no God, there is no law, only man's plan. The plan, in fact, must work to dissociate itself from justice because it seeks to separate itself from God. Kaufman derided the concept of justice as a biblical hangover. Albert Camus said, Since God claims all that is good in man, it is necessary to deride what is good and choose what is evil. The Rebel, page 47 The modern humanistic state has done exactly that. Its course is self-consciously humanistic. The US Supreme Court legalized abortion and, in the process, avoided any consideration of a biblical position. All kinds of premises were examined, but not that of God's law. No transcendent law order was given any attention. Law was replaced by the humanistic plan. Elections, however important, cannot change the mind and heart of man. Law is, in essence, a religious question. When even churches are indifferent to God's law, the state will be also. But to be indifferent to God's law is to deny that God is God and that his law word alone is sovereign, like himself. But if there is no God, then there is no law and no justice.